so we, we chose to do the Walmart Kegel competition. Uh, so that, again, much like uh, everyone else in our co cohort, this was our first uh, Kegel competition. So it was a, a great learning experience to kind of work with a real data set provided by um, a business and kind of see how we could kind of approach the problem and, and work through the data. Um, so just a quick introduction of the data set. This was um, a market basket analysis. Um, basically, Walmart uh, created a system where they have about 38 trip classifications. So whether or not you're, you're coming in for your just grabbing dinner to go or lunch or you're making your weekly grocery shopping trip. Um, they wanted, based on all the proprietary information that they have on their shoppers, they classified into these 38 groups. Um, so what they asked of the Kaggle community was, can you, given a given a limited set of features, um, come up with the same classification that Walmart uses. So can they kind of do it in a more efficient manner? Um, so the structure of the data is, is a pretty large data set, larger than um, many of us have ever worked with. There was over 1.2 million records. Um, each record represented an item. So uh, the features uh, in the training data, which is about half of the 1.2 million, included a trip type, which was the classification um, that they wanted us to predict. Um, but the only data that they gave us was the visit number, which was a unique ID number for each uh, visit that was represented in the data set, uh, the weekday that the shopper uh, entered the store, um, and then for each visit, there was a separate line item for each UPC that was purchased, the number of items uh, that were purchased or returned given that UPC. Um, a general department description, there was um, 68 unique department descriptions, and then a fine line number, which kind of gave a little bit more granularity into what type of item it was. This information, though, was um, categorical numeric IDs, so it didn't really give us, uh, like, just looking at the data, we didn't really know what it meant. It was more of finding patterns. Our, our, our task was to find the patterns and try to come up with the classification. Um, so the main challenges were um, that the trip uh, data was separated uh, for each item purchased, so we needed to figure out a way to group that together to represent one trip, because we're classifying uh, these based on the trips, not by every single item. So we needed all the information of all the items that were purchased in the trip to come to a conclusion of what trip type this might be. Um, and the size of the data was quite large and you know running this on a, a MacBook with 8 gigs of RAM uh, you kind of run into some computational um, roadblocks so that was um, our main challenges and kind of so we're going to walk through the different models that we looked at and how we tried to kind of come to a conclusion. Brandon? Hi there uh, my name is Brandon and so we did kind of a divide and conquer strategy what we did was we said that each person in the group would try a different algorithm, a different uh, machine learning method for this. So I was tasked with using logistic regression. Now, uh, for those of you not familiar with logistic regression, it works a little bit, well, so if you know about uh, linear regression, you're trying to basically get a set of points and you're trying to minimize uh, the mean squared error. Uh, in, in this case, what you're trying to do is you're trying to minimize this function right here. I won't go into all the mathematics with it, but basically, uh, logistic regression is usually great for classification problems, especially if there are only two classes, if it's a zero or a one, if it's a yes or a no. In this case, uh, since there were so many different classes, what I used was multinomial uh, logistic regression, which generalizes logistic regression to uh, multi-class problems. So, in this case, what I did was if I can go back a little bit, uh, you saw all of these different features here. So we're trying to predict trip types. So there are about 38 different trip types that we want to predict. So basically, we're trying to predict on 38 different classes. And so what I did was I, I looked at all these, and I, I could have run a model on all of these sets, on, on every single one of these different features. But then I would have had to create dummy variables, which would have taken, so already the, the prediction what do you call it, the, the training set, is 600,000 lines and only seven columns. If I tried to create dummy variables, it would have been thousands of columns, which would have made things really difficult for my little tiny Lenovo four gigabyte uh, you know, memory laptop. Wouldn't have been able to deal with all that. So for the sake of simplicity, and since this is my first time really doing a serious Kaggle competition, I just looked at 
uh, I looked at weekday and department description. So when you create dummy variables for those, because there are only seven weekdays and there are only uh, 68 unique departments, that resulted in uh, 75 dummy variable columns. So I ran the model, and uh, with a little bit of finagling, I got it so that it only took about two minutes for the code to run on my computer. I submitted it to Kaggle. I got a log loss score of 4.22, and my Kaggle rank was initially 425. It, no, no, I'm sorry. It was initially 420, and then it dropped down to 437. So in the future, if I was to continue working with this, I might try to do a little bit more feature engineering. Maybe I would have added another column and maybe another computer, I guess. <laughs> so I'll pass it now along next to uh, Nate. So I uh, used uh, Random Forest as my method. Uh, Random Forest is an uh, ensemble built on top of decision trees. So decision trees uh, are very simple models. They are uh, easy to interpret, good for classification. Uh, you split at each node uh, based upon uh, the reduction in either the, the Gini or the entropy. Uh, so you're looking for, uh, you're trying to optimize the purity at each of the leaf nodes based on this split. Uh, so classification uh, for decision trees, it's a greedy algorithm in the sense that at each split, it makes the, the split that gives you the greatest uh, reduction in Gini or entropy uh, in the leaves. Not So it's not looking down further into the tree, making it the split here that's going to optimize the lowest entropy or Gini at the, uh, at the bottom of the tree. Uh, so with random forest, uh, you're building, it's an ensemble method where you're building uh, many trees. Uh, and then all of these trees, uh, you then vote on the classification at the end based on all of these trees. Uh, so with this, it should be noted that uh, you avoid, you would have an, so an issue with random forest is that you're building all these trees on the same data, and that you uh, all these these trees are going to be correlated. So you're going to have a problem with your with uh, your prediction. You're going to have a poor prediction as a result of the high correlation between these trees. So each of these specific trees, you choose randomly a subset of the features to build your trees on. So you say choose ten features for one tree, and at each one of these splits it's going to choose the feature from those 10 randomly selected features that best uh, reduces the J uh, at that split. So uh, basically, this is kind of the, saying the same thing. Uh, so I engineered uh, more features that uh, with the Walmart uh, problem, you weren't allowed to use any external data. In this problem, you were only allowed to uh, build features based on the information that was available. Uh, so I built a, a bunch of very simple arithmetic features, looking at the total number of items that were purchased in each trip, uh, just, uh, looking to see uh, if items were returned, looking at what percentage of the trip was returned, looking at percentage uh, based on, uh, so how many, what percentage of the trip shares a fine line, the fine line is uh, an internal classification that Walmart uses to group items based on um, how often they are purchased together. So soap, toothpaste, and toothbrushes probably all share the same fine line number. Uh, I also looked at uh, the percentage of purchase based on the UPC. Uh, and these, these features that I've listed here were the ones that gave me uh, that proved to be the most important. I, I generated pretty much any feature uh, that I could think of to try to uh, extract more information from what was given to you. Uh, so I ran this uh, 10 times uh, that's shown here. And you can see that uh, 
the uh, just this is so this is basically just from feature engineering uh, with random forest that I was able to reduce the log loss from 6.3 all the way down to uh, roughly two. Uh, so uh, you can see here, I initially uh, the only feature engineering that I did in the training set. There is a department that's only found in the training set, uh, and it's only there's only two instances of it. It's uh, health and beauty products. So I uh, based it based on the fact that there were over 600,000 rows. I felt that I could remove that department from the training set because the test set has to have the same, uh, same features. Uh, and I also, there was about 9,000 NANDs in, uh, in the training set. And I, can, uh, I didn't want to drop those because your, the set that you submit has to be of the same dimensions as the set that's given to you. Uh, so I just uh, converted all the NANDs in the data set to uh, a number that was not found within the data set, uh, negative 1,000. Uh, so the, the NANs were all found in the fine line number, UPC, and department. Uh, and then you can see I just add different features. Uh, and as I add different features to the, uh, these different ar arithmetic features to my model, I'm able to reduce the Gini. And then ultimately, uh, once I had a model that I was happy with, I did a grid search on the uh, features, or sorry, on the parameters that allowed me to tune my uh, uh, random forest. So that's things that you can tune. You can look at the depth of the trees. Do you want to, uh, you know, how many, how many uh, samples have to be in a leaf before you stop splitting? Do you want to, I mean, if you built a decision tree that only had one, uh, one sample in each leaf, you would have, you're going to have, based on your training set, you're going to have a 0% error rate, but you're going to have overfit your model when you test it on the, uh, the test set. So I developed all these features, uh, and then here, just using a grid search and cross-validation, I optimized those features for, uh, for this specific data set. I know that in the Rossman for example, in the Rossman competition, they uh, only grew their trees to a certain depth. I think it was uh, a depth of 30. For me, it was optimal to, uh, to grow as, as deep a tree as possible based on my uh, data set. So I was able to, just through feature engineering, uh, I, was, I felt that uh, I was able to make great gains uh, in my performance. I went from ranked roughly number 400 to number 240. Uh, but I think that there is kind of an upper limit on the performance of just random forest. Uh, I, after doing this, used uh, XGBoost, only running it 20 times. And generally, they, they, want you, they say you should use XGBoost between 1,000 and 10,000 times. Uh, and only after 20 iterations, I was able to perform almost as well as random forest alone. Okay. Um, so I, I was charged with uh, employing a gradient boosted tree model, which again is another ensemble method where you have uh, a sequence of weaker models that uh, subsequent ones um, focus more on things that were misclassified by earlier ones. Uh, I chose to use the Python module XGBoost, which seems to be really popular in the Kaggle community um, for its efficiency and uh, parallelization. Um, I chose to use these features, which are all of them except for the UPC codes. There were more than 100,000 of them, um, so it just seemed to me to be too you know, unwieldy in the, the time that was given to us. Uh, so what I did with, with these, um, I created from, from those, those features data set that had uh, one row per visit. So that's what the, the training set um, or the submission file needed to look like. And for each visit number, I uh, had the number of purchases. So I separated the scan count in, from uh, things that were purchased and things that were returned. So purchases, returns. And then for every single department, um, I created a column and the cell in that 
uh, for that observation would contain the number of times that department was visited and similarly for the fine line number um, there were consider there were a lot more of those than departments um, so what resulted from this was a huge data set where most of the entries were zero um, and frankly I, I think I maybe <laughs> bit off more than I could chew with that I uh, my computer just simply would not handle that. So uh, what I decided to do was split um, the, the training set into two disjoint subsets, train two XG boosts, and basically average uh, their results. But being that this was my first time with Kaggle and uh, uh, obviously the first time using XG boost, uh, I was a little lost, frankly, with the uh, sort of the number of parameters that you can tune um, so after after a long time of just trial and error uh, sitting there watching my computer spit out log loss scores I, I found this uh, Python module called hyperop which uh, basically does uh, an optimized search over a space of hyperparameters you supply it with uh, an objective function and it basically optimizes or minimizes that objective function over hyperparameter space and gives you back the, the optimal parameters. Um, what I got from that was, was, not, was not a great score, 1.48, I don't know where that would put me on the, on the leaderboard. Um, <clears throat> it seems like a lot of people are, are also using, using this, this method, but uh, with much greater results, much better results. Um, I think the thing that I would take away from this is uh, spending a lot more time thinking about how to come up with clever features instead of just throwing them all in in this this huge sparse data frame. Um, but that that was that was about it. So, so who was yeah. yeah. So I mean, the biggest challenge was the size of the data set. Um, also, as Nate mentioned, we weren't able to use any external data, so that was. Uh, a big limitation, kind of uh, engineering features off of only seven original categorical variables uh, made it kind of difficult. Um, but it was our first uh, kind of competition. Uh, we learned a lot, and uh, so in that regard, I would say it was a success. So, any uh, questions? Uh, which method had the biggest loss between the training? Uh, so um, that would have been random forest. However, XGBoost wasn't um, uh, on the leaderboard yet, as of as of before this presentation. So <laughs> now, there was a way. There was a problem with the way that I prepared the data set. That once I made it to predict uh, on the on the test set, the dimensions didn't match up or something. I, I probably did something earlier. That, that sort of made that happen, and it, it takes it takes a long time to train, um, so I didn't have time to do it before this.